Fireworks. Yeah, good time. Uh, let's just remember uh, remember where true freedom lies. Uh, freedom that can only be found through Christ Jesus. Uh, I heard a story about a young man who had just started working as a produce clerk at Walmart. He's doing his rounds, doing his thing, and a lady walks up to him and said, asked him, uh, asked him to if she could buy a half a head of lettuce. Well, he tried to explain to her that they only sell lettuce in the, uh, at, by the whole head or in the pre-bagged salads. The lady was very determined to get what she wanted and she just kept on and kept on. Uh, he finally told her, I'm going to have to go talk to my manager. So he starts walking toward the back of the store looking for his manager, but he never realized the lady was right behind him. He finally found his manager and Without looking behind him, not knowing she wasn't there, he said, Hey, uh, boss, this old bag out here wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. What should I tell her? And, uh, of course, he sees the horrified look on his manager's face. He turns around and sees the lady, and almost immediately he adds, And this nice lady would like to buy the other half. What should we do? <laughs> it's amazing how such a small part of our body can cause so much trouble. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the tongue. Our tongues are of great concern to James. Uh, so much that he addresses them throughout the use of his book. In chapter 3, he uses it as a test of living faith. Because the genuineness of a person's faith will be demonstrated by their speech. For the things that come out of a person's mouth come from their heart. Let's read James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12 together. Not so many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member. It boasts of great things. How great is a forest, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now let's look at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged with great strictness. James begins the uh, chapter 3 by talking about the influence teachers have upon us. Uh, a lot of times people will want to be standing here or to teach a Sunday school class or, or teach in the church. And a lot of times they, they don't think about how serious it is. Uh, they, they don't stop to think that teachers are held to a higher standard because of the influence they have. No one's perfect. And we say things that we shouldn't. And sadly, we can't take them back once they're said. And what you say publicly can have devastating results. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, there was a uh, Christian broadcaster on the TVN network named Pat Robertson. 
uh, he made some comments publicly on television about it being okay for a man to commit adultery simply because he's a man. Uh, now, obviously, TVN issued numerous apologies almost immediately, uh, but the comments that were flying around the internet were just tearing Christians up everywhere. Not just Pat Robertson, not just his church, all Christians were thrown into this pot because of the comments one man made. Teachers can have a good influence as well as a bad. Unfortunately, most of the time, people, especially of the world, not of the church, only remember the bad things. Uh, actions like this are bad influences, even if they weren't intended to be that way. And Jesus gives us a solemn warning to those who cause others to stumble. Jesus said, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of these things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eyes cause you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Being a, being a bad influence does have consequences, both on the, in this world and the next. So if, if you've considered a position of leadership as, as a teacher in a church, uh, it's Jesus I mean, tells us it's, it's something to seriously consider. Paul shows us in Titus chapter 1 uh, the qualifications for an elder. I, I use this as an example because a lot of times in a lot of churches, an elder is an appointed leader who often teaches. Uh, verse 9 of Titus 1 says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. One who teaches must be able to be taught. They must be teachable. And, must have, and above all, they must hold firmly to God's word and encourage others based upon sound doctrine, biblical doctrine. James is simply telling us before you uh, run off and try to become a teacher, uh, just to consider what a teacher does. Their primary tool for their job is their tongue. And when they speak, they need to be skilled in what they're saying uh, because of the devastating potential a tongue has. When we take a position of a teacher, we should have a sense of the seriousness involved. Whether it's teaching in children's ministry, uh, Sunday school, uh, group Bible study, one-on-one, -on -one, or preparing a message to present to your church. Uh, we must give our heart over to, to God's Word and allow the necessary time for God to prepare our hearts so that we know what we're going to say. As I stand here today, uh, it, this is only the second time I've preached in a long time uh, and I can count on both hands how many times I've preached in my whole life uh, I, I'm actually to be honest with you I'm terrified I'm terrified that I will say the wrong thing that I will interpret scripture badly uh, and be that bad influence James is talking about uh, because teachers will be judged more strictly they have a greater responsibility and they will be held accountable now, if we look at verse 2, it says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. When James says we all stumble, what, what he really means is we all sin. Uh, and if you notice, it's in the present tense, which means it's continuous. We, we never stop. We're unable to stop. Here he's specifically dealing with the tongue. However, he encourages us and gives us a little bit of encouragement. Uh, 
Because he goes on to say we can control our tongue. And when we can control our tongue, we can have the discipline to control our whole body. Because the tongue is the hardest thing to control. In verse 3, James says, If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide our whole bodies as well. If you've never been around horses, bits are got two rings on the end and usually some kind of shank, different shapes and sizes that go through a horse's mouth. The way a bit works is that it applies pressure to the horse's tongue and his jaw. So a younger horse being broke or in the beginning of being trained needs a bit that, that really mashes down uh, so you can control the animal. As the horse gets older, uh, you can use a less aggressive bit. Uh, some horses even get to the point to where they don't even need a bit once they're used to it. Uh, if you don't have control of the horse and you're on him, the horse is going to go where he wants to go. And I, I think James is trying to, trying to show us that if we don't have control of our tongue, our tongues can take us to a place we don't want to go. Uh, if you look at verse 4, the, you go, there should be a picture of an aircraft carrier. Okay. Yeah, yeah there it is. Uh, verse 4 says, look at ships also. They are so large and driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot goes. Uh, this is a little bit more of a modern example than what James was talking about. This is a Nimitz class aircraft carrier. It displaces uh, 101,000 tons of water. It's 1,100 feet long. It's nuclear powered. Holds about 5,700 personnel and 85 aircraft of various types. Again, this is a more modern example, but, but what we learn, and it, and it fits the bill. If you go to the next one, Chad. If you look right up there toward the back, it's red on the bottom. Even this great ship, these floating cities, have a rudder. Uh, now there's a lot more involved in driving this ship than, than the sailboats James was talking about, but, but the principle is still the same. The tongue, although small, just like the bit in the rudder, has control, has the power to control our body. And James is saying we must get bridle over our tongue. Proverbs 4.24 says, Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. When we become Christians, we should change. We should have a change in heart. We should have a change in life. We shouldn't take part in rude jokes, vulgar speech like swearing. Because it doesn't have a good influence. It paints a bad picture of us. And more, more importantly, it paints a bad picture of God. In verse 5, James tells us, See also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How a great force is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue has great power. The tongue has power to destroy. It's like a small spark that can set a forest on fire. Every summer we hear about wildfires throughout the southwest and well here lately they're going up north too. Uh, wildfires that, that just destroy acres and acres and acres of, of countryside, destroy homes, destroy people's lives. Uh, and most of them often uh, Often they're started by campers who are irresponsible with their fire, but a lot of times they're started by a simple raindrop and the sun shining through it and setting some dry brush on fire. Uh, the tongue is the same way. It, it's a, it's a, it can be a very small spark. It can be just one little insignificant comment that just sets your life into a separate course, uh, a separate direction than you ever intended to go. Uh, take for example King Herod at his birthday one time uh, his daughter uh, danced for the crowd Herod was so pleased with his daughter's performance he boasted in front of everybody uh, ask for anything you want and I will give it to you up to half my kingdom 
But when she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter, he was he wasn't ready for that. Uh, but reluctantly, he fulfilled her request. The Bible encourages us not to boast. And Jesus simply said, Yet your, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Verse 6 tells us, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting the entire course of life on fire by hell. As a church, we are the body of Christ. We are all connected through Jesus Christ. Everything one of us does or says affects everybody else. We all influence each other. The tongue through negative gossip can set a church on fire. And it takes a lot of effort to undo the damage when that happens. Jesus told us it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, but rather what comes out of their mouth that defiles them. Not only does it defile you, it defiles everyone around you. It corrupts the whole body. That's why it's like a fire. At the end of verse 6, it says, set on fire by hell. The tongue can be set on fire by the gracious Spirit of God to produce peace, a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Or it can be set on fire from the pits of hell. If you do a search for the word tongue in the Bible, you'll find it listed. My numbers may not be exactly accurate, but you'll find it listed about 133 times. And what this is what I learned about what the tongue can do. The tongue flatters, it curses, it boasts, it betrays, it accuses, it speaks deceit. Uses devious words, lies, seduces, speaks, per, speaks perversion. It's spiteful plus destruction and has the potential for death. No wonder one writer said that's why God put the tongue behind a cage of teeth surrounded by the mouth because of the potential damage it can do. Verse 7 and 8 tells us, for every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Mankind has, has been able to tame all kinds of animals uh, throughout history. Uh, one time years ago, me and a bunch of my friends went to medieval times right outside of Houston, Texas. And I remember that trip. We were there to celebrate a friend's birthday, but what I remember most about that trip is we sat and watched. Uh, they demonstrated uh, some of the tricks uh, in the way they trained their horses and the falcons. Uh, this one guy, he had a falcon that he would just make, he had a little clicker and make some clicks, and this falcon would take off, fly across the way, and bring something back to him. I mean, it was, it was pretty cool. Then, you know, up near Chicago, we got the Shedd Aquarium, and you can go there and you can see these dolphins that do amazing things that, that at, at our will. Men can tame just about any, well, any animal. The Bible tells us any animal can be tamed. But one thing we haven't been able to tame is our tongue. If you ever... Uh, walked away from somebody grumbling underneath your breath because they irritated you or made you mad. Uh, or have you gotten angry and said something you wish you hadn't that you can't take back? Or even if what you were saying was right, you were wrong because the way you said it. Heather and I, a few weeks ago, uh, had, a, had an argument about the kids. I felt... Heather was being unfair to three of them and treating one of them uh, being more lenient on him. We had not a major argument, but we did have a difference of opinion on this. Uh, well, I didn't know it, but Hayden heard us argue. The next morning, I come downstairs and Hayden's visibly upset with me, uh, shaken up and... Uh, 
I can't remember if you or me, one of us asked him what was wrong, and, and he told us that he didn't like he didn't like the fact that when I yelled at her, and I yelled it, uh, the difference between you and me is at least I'm fair. Hayden heard that, and it bothered me. But when Hayden's saying this, and I see how upset he is, it, it hit me. It hit me like a Mack truck. At that point, Heather told Hayden, Hayden Lane was not wrong. He is, he's right. I'm easier on you than I am the other kids. I couldn't believe it. She admitted she was wrong. Most men would have been turning cartwheels and jumping around and hooting and calling their friends. You're not going to believe it. She said she was wrong. Because that almost never happens. But seriously, in that moment, I realized because of what I said, even though it was factual, the fact that I said it out of anger, my case no longer held water. My point was no longer valid. I had no argument at that point because of the way I said it. We, uh, we use our tongues to discipline our children, to rebuke our loved ones when needed, and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. But if we do not do these things without true biblical love, we've done nothing but made noise. Discipline without love is merely abuse. And love without discipline is merely neglect. Even though no man can tame the tongue, uh, God can. For what's possible, what's not possible with man is possible with God. God can tame your tongue when you submit your will to His. When you meditate on God's Word, When you study the Bible. When I did a word search for the word tongue, I also found tongues can defend, they can speak justice, rejoice, sing, speak of righteousness, bring healing, speak wisdom, build each other up. And one day, as Chris said earlier, every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is our Lord. If we look at verse 9 and 10, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse the people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and curses. My brother, these things ought not be so. James is simply saying we can praise God and cuss somebody out in the next minute. I'll be honest with you, oftentimes I do it at the same time. Uh, driving down the road and listening to a sermon or some, some good music on the radio, some good praise music, and somebody cuts you off. And the next thing you know, you're, you're screaming at them, you're upset. Uh, but James tells us it shouldn't be this way. Uh, we can come into this building on Sundays and praise God and walk out the door and uh, curse His creation, curse other people. Uh, we weren't alone in this. Uh, at one point, Peter declared Jesus was the Messiah. And then a few weeks later, he cursed vehemently saying that he didn't know who he was. I just can't imagine being alive when Jesus was alive. And, and I just can't imagine denying him. As Christians, we should be new creations with a new character. Romans 12:14 says, "Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse." This is part of being transformed as we mature in the spirit and we gain control of our tongue. We should not curse anyone because they are made in the image of God. What James is saying here that if we're not acting like this, we have to consider the source. Take a look at verse 11 and 12. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from a spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt spring produce fresh water. Everyone knows that salt water and fresh water don't flow from the same, same source. It's either one or the other. 
James is telling us we'll know what kind of tree it is by the fruit it bears. So if we claim to be Christians and we talk like this, like James cautions us not to talk, we may not be who we say we are. Or simply, we may need to repent. The last time I stood up here, I talked about personal accountability. Not blaming others for your sins. And this is really no different than that. But yet it's so much more powerful because of the influence your words have. If you can't bridle your tongue, get control of your speech, it makes people look at Christians. It makes us, it makes us look bad. And like I said before, it makes God look bad. When we do this, people are able to call us hypocrites. Uh, it gives them fuel to try to poke holes in Scripture, to, to try to twist Scripture to fit what they're saying. Uh, in conclusion, let's take what Peter told us. He said, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic and love one another, be compassionate and be humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing because this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. It's in 1 Peter. If we claim to believe in Jesus, our actions have to say that. Have to show that. If we claim to be a Christian, a person should be able to tell as we walk down the sidewalk without ever speaking to us that we are who we say we are. That we act like we're commanded to act. If we do this, others will look to us for advice, for help. And more importantly, others will see what God is really like. We you use your tongue to spray the fiery venom. venom that comes straight from the depths of hell? Or will you use it to spread the fire that God has lit in our hearts? If you might be asking yourself, how can I do what no man has been able to do? I know someone who can help you. We are far from perfect and unable in this world to not sin. When we do sin, we must truly repent. That means asking forgiveness and making an honest effort to change. If you've been born again, you know what to do. If you haven't been born again, you can be. You can be washed of your sins. You can be forgiven. You can be made a new person. You can escape hell and trade it for eternal life. If you feel like I might be talking to you directly, well, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. God has brought you here today for a reason. Acknowledge Jesus as your Savior. Tell God you want a close relationship with Him. Repent of your sins and ask for forgiveness. We are saved by grace through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Blood that He shed on the cross for all of us. He rose from the grave to once and all, once and for all, remove the bondage of sin and set us free. All you have to do is accept the gift our Father is trying to hand you today. All you have to do is ask that your heart be set on fire from heaven so it will pour out through your tongue. This is how God can tame your flammable tongue. Let's pray. 
Dear Father God, we just we just thank you for the words you've given us today. Uh, and we thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for your Son Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that that you you have these words move in our hearts. Uh, have us do what we're supposed to do. Have us live like you want us to live. Lord, I just ask that as we leave here today. Uh, you stay with us, walk with us. Thank you for loving us. The power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.